Hello, hello. Welcome to a little discussion on storytelling, everyone. Um, I wanted to start off this conversation kind of rooted a little bit in the sense that we are here, we're at F1. There's a lot of partnerships that are going on around here, as you guys heard just saw this past panel. And I think this year, um, especially, we learned a lot about the importance of really looking at how partnerships work for your brand and how when you are doing storytelling, it's, it's really important to identify partners that are extending your brand story in a really meaningful way. So I'd love to first start asking you guys, um, you know, with your brands, when we're looking at partnering and partnerships, um, how are you guys approaching evaluating those partnerships and identifying which are the right ones? And even if you were looking at partnering with some of the brands here, Today and F1, what that might look like. Go. We'll just do it together. Yeah, sorry. Um, before, I've been in Facebook 13 years, and I technology. So it's made in my We're homies. And it's a, um, just probably the most nice story. Sorry, but go for it. A lawyer there um, was part of the McLaren sponsorship um, or the innovation partnership. And so if you think of the influencer, we actually use the car as an influencer. And it was really a fantastic way to tell our technology, technology story, as in the, the wheels go around because of the technology that is analyzing that data to go faster and to make it stop. And so, um, with, you know, given the F1 crowd, um, you know, that is definitely a sponsorship that you don't want to slap a logo on. You want to be able to integrate with that brand and tell your product story in an authentic way and in a really cool way. I'll add on to that, Rachel. Yeah. All right, yeah. All the it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Anyway, um, yeah, just to add on to that, even using the partnership in unexpected ways, we've found um, a way to tie into a McLaren partnership with our alien, our gaming brand, which is super premium. Using that to bring to events with a simulator, so kind of um, you know bringing the racing experience, which is not available to you know everybody on the planet. But through technology and through the McLaren um, partnership, we're able to bring simulators on site so people can experience the, the race itself. Hi, <laughs> right, right. um, We have, I don't know if I answer that question. We don't do a lot of partnerships. Um, Upper is the world's largest creative platform, so millions of people who do everything from coding to uh, being a lawyer. Uh, and, uh, People who want to hire that. And so, if we're going to be doing a partnership, we usually partner with people who are on our platform. And so, we have like 12 million influencers who happen to be on our platform, and we use them to either demystify the world of freelancing to future freelancers or to um, demystify the world of using a freelance based uh, business model for those who are looking to not that their company. So, um, Partnership, my last job was the brand director, the brand director of Harley Davidson, which was a much different story when it came to uh, partnerships, but that has completely shifted um, in, in kind of this, this, new, uh, this new world I have now. So, you know, that's the first thing to that one. I actually think that it's really important. I actually think we, very similarly, hi, I'm Lindsay, by the way. I saw my hands and thoughts. Um, so, very similarly, our my favorite partners, my favorite influencers are our chef customers. And we're very fortunate to be used by 3,000 restaurants around the world. And there's nothing more authentic than somebody who's paying us to use our product. Uh, and when they turn into the ambassador and the evangelist, it's a much better flywheel for me than paying influencer as media. So we've been really you know, fortunate to kind of turn the traditional influencer partnership model on its head a little bit. Because I can use my customers to talk to my customers. And our home goes, which is you know, about a million humans in our CRM today, our chefs love having access to those you know, really engaged, culinarily curious minds at home. Um, and those home hosts are so keen to learn from and have access to the you know, peek behind the curtain of culinary culture and get this kind of really insider suit. So for us, it's really great to have some really authentic evangelists um, for our customers first and foremost. And that perfectly segues me into my next area, which is in regards to influencers. And I think, you know, we did a little pre-chat together, and I heard such different answers around this. And I think uh, it's something you guys should hear. But I, I, you know, we know that influencer marketing definitely has taken on a, a 
mind of its own. And I work with a ton of different types of brands at Influential, and they all approach it in a really, in their own really unique ways. And so I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about influencer marketing in the, you know, how you guys are envisioning it for your brands and, and where you see yourselves going with influencers in the future. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can speak from um, the Dell side. I'm also been fortunate to work at brands like Andrew Scott and Lululemon. And to your point, everyone approaches it completely differently. So a lot of great learnings. I think to back on what Lindsay said, which I really like culinary, or did you say culinary? Curiosity. Curiosity. So that to this fast. Um, but it's the authenticity that really matters. I mean, at the advent of the influencer industry, the beauty was the, the credibility, right? It was just a very natural endorsement. And now it's this big to play model in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, Gen Z can sniff it out in, in a heartbeat and they'll come at you and, and tell you, you know, your this doesn't feel real to your brand. But I think the rest of the consumers can as well. So we like to approach it at Dental. Uh, you know, we've tried it a couple different thousand iterations, but what feels the most powerful is when we are finding the customers on social through listening who are actually using our products. It's all too often that we've paid for a partnership or paid an influencer, and then we see a week later in their feed, and their feed, they're not using their MacBook. It's like, oh, 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 last week. Like, that was our first date. We thought about that. Well. So, yeah, you have to really find people that can evangelize very naturally, and that, I think the relationship's really awesome, most beautiful. I'll just add super tactically. For us, that means putting a bright red line between content creators and influencers who I really want their audience. And treating influencers who I really want their audience more like any other paid media channel. And we hold them to the very high standards of any other performance marketing channel. And we are very rigorous about what's working, what's not working, what product is resonating with that audience. We treat them much more specifically like media. And then, like I said, our chefs become that content creation engine for us. And I don't need to ensure we need the two. Actually, I'm paying for their audience. I don't need their content. I'd rather create content that's very authentic and very real. And now jump in from a B2B point of view. So um, I know we didn't get to completely introduce ourselves, but um, so right now, um, I know there's recent companies that are going to pay, and it's a B2B uh, legal software and tech brand. And so we have a unique um, approach where we actually have one um, on our payroll. Um, but she wears two hats. So first of all, she's a lawyer, so check credibility. She's a techie, check that credibility. But then she's also a member of the press. She writes a lot of articles, so we have that credibility. So we have to work really hard to make sure that she doesn't cross that line of pushing our products too much, where it becomes like her credibility starts to falter versus you know making sure that what she says is credible and then we use our products and when it's most relevant and when it feels authentic. And so um, we have found that to be a great way to start to establish that thought leadership in a natural way um, using our influencer. Man, I feel like you guys are just beautifully segueing in tonight's topics, which was our yeah, story types. Uh, I love it. I love it. Uh, thought leadership. So I, I actually feel like sometimes when we are thinking about marketing efforts and communicating, um, thought leadership is not often seen as part of like the marketing mix, whereas it is another version and form of storytelling for us as brands. So I'd love to hear a little bit more and, and hear you guys expand more on um, how you're approaching thought leadership in, in a really meaningful way that can help you connect with your, your target consumers. I think I can take that one. Um, when I came on to work, uh, it was at a very pivotal time in the world where we were rethinking the way that we thought about work, um, which was the first time we had done so since we used to drive horses to work. Um, it it the Dutch Revolution. And, um, and so when I came to thought leadership, a lot of people were looking all around trying to figure out, okay, what's this new way of working that we're doing? Is it just we were remote, or kind of both, or remote for now, and, and how do we use and that? And so when we um, were looking to do our most recent brand campaign, we were trying to kind of like be a thought leader through that paid campaign, but also be a thought leader through, um, through kind of more combusting uh, the current conversation that's happening. 
So the most recent we did for that was during AI. So our timeline is, is how we work now. It's meant to be as much a reflection of the moment when you say it as 10 years you know, later when you say it. It's also a very kind of temporal moment when you say it. So when we first said it, it was in relation to um, the shift from working in an office to working remote. Uh, and then when AI came around, it was like, oh shit, our channels are going to be gone. Um, we're like, no, 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 this is just how we work now, let's do this and buy it for you. And so what we ended up doing was, uh, rather than doing a whole paid ad campaign tradition with the TDS and stuff like that, we ended up taking on all the paid ads in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal, where people were actually looking at, you know, looking for evaluation from, uh, you know, those were writing articles in those, in those papers. And we took a whole paid ad and said, um, we're trying to play. And it was basically just a thought leadership piece, like a long format back in the good old days when the car apps were great. Um, and it was basically just saying, like, hey, we've been here before as, as a um, as a workforce, as a you know, as humanity, where you, know, you look back to the printing press, you look back to the internet, the cell phone, all these things that you know, a lot of people look at and be like, that's gonna put me out of work, or that's gonna put a lot of people out of work. And actually, statistically speaking, create a lot more work, not less. And so um, rather than being like, hey, we are up for the AI experts on here, we decided to take a totally different approach and, and be more of um, you know, an editorial contributor to the narrative as opposed to someone who's trying to make that from top of something. And I saw about 50% the next day. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. I would really be the example of the validation group because um, you've taken on what, what we went through. Um, and I'm a leader. So um, one of the things that's interesting about the trends of the flyer behaviors that are happening, and so I'm going to set the context here, which is about 80% of the B2B buyer funnel is done um, before they even talk to a salesperson. So you absolutely have to be in the market with content before then. And not only that, um, there's a study that said they have about 15 touches of content before they actually talk to a person. So you know you have to have that content and thought leadership's a great way to get there. But then so speaking of Gen Z, um, this is actually millennial staff. Almost 50% of them, you know, this is B2B, don't even want to talk to a salesperson. And they just want to do their business either online or through other means. And so really we're really thinking, how do we do B2B marketing? Um, you know, it's no longer this like get a lead, get them in front of sales. They don't want to be stopped by sales. And so um, we're really trying to think of what are those ways of thought leadership, great content, and also self-service sales models from a B2B perspective that can can really help um, better business in the future. Okay. Um, you know, speaking of some other things that like our industry tends to have a lot of pride around, and that's the, the sense of breakthrough work, innovative work, one of the best words that go around winning the award these days. Um, how are you guys, when you're looking at the way that you're marketing, how are you ensuring that you have content that's going out there that's really breaking through, not going to just kind of keep you in the same messaging zone or look as some of your competitors. I feel like competition springs up like this these days, almost in every other industry, uh, thanks to technology. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm passionate about the breakthrough and about disrupting in a positive way. Um, but I mean, the look at the landscape, the path to purchase is more complex than ever now for any segment. The volume of messages that are flooding any customer is overwhelming. Our attention spans are getting shorter, shorter, shorter. Was heard Google Fish chat a thousand times over, and I know myself that I need to do it as well. And coupled with all of those dynamics, with I read a stat from Martin Lindstrom's book recently um, that 92% of shoppers make decisions emotionally. So like 8% are using logic to make a purchase decision. I mean, guilty as charged. I can justify anything that's going on. And we're not alone, right? So I find myself in a lot of meetings with the product team or whomever, where they're like, oh, let's talk about the megahertz on this computer. Let's talk about the right of the gig. Like, no money is <laughs> Literally, no one cares. I'm sure I know the product is great and that's amazing street cred and yay, but that's not my people are buying. Like, I know all of us can probably cite a brand campaign or a brand moment from two months ago or two years ago or 
two weeks ago that has stuck with us. Like, that's the inspiration that I try to use to drive the vision, right? Like, one example, Kmart. I don't shop at Kmart, but I do remember one of the brand campaigns where uh, it would be better YouTube video, but <laughs> it was uh, they started shipping, and the whole campaign was I shipped my pants. Oh yeah, like, I can, I, it was amazing, right? You remember it? I'm talking, this was ten years ago. I'm like, talking about it now. Like that's a sticky, memorable, breakthrough moment. Rest in peace, Kmart. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah. The end of that story didn't come full circle. Yeah. But those are the types of, of things that you have to do to emotionally connect with your audience. It's not about a product, it's not about a price. It's about the brand and that, that emotional storytelling. I was I was gonna say one thing that when you talk about making breakthrough work as marketers, I mean uh, no one wants to do the opposite of that, right? So everyone's going to have to do that, but for some reason when you look at the and the landscape of advertising, a lot of it looks exactly the fucking same. <laughs> Especially if you cut start subsecting into different, um, you know, the financial sector or uh, tech sector or whatever. The tech brands, for example, and uh, if you took the color blue out of logos, you lose ninety percent of logos. And and so when we were doing our most recent brand campaigns, you know, we were looking at every single other piece of. Um, of advertising out there, not to say, oh, here's what we should do, because that's the safe thing to do. Um, we decided to, you know, uh, bet our careers at, at this company on, like, hey, we should do something completely different. And if we want to stand out, we need to stand out. We need to stand for something. And so uh, we looked at, at our competitive set. It was uh, a lot of very earnest. It was, hey, we're, we're, here, to, we're here to help you find a job. That's important. And it is important, but it doesn't even talk about it that way, because no one cares. And so instead, we uh, did a musical where a zombie CEO comes back from the dead to tell his company to do the ball along. And uh, our, uh, the core metric we were measuring, which was um, awareness amongst uh, enterprise buyers, went up 600% in six months. And so like, if you want to stand out, you need to actually stand for something first and then do it in a way to stand out, like actually do it in a way to stand out. Um, which is usually scary to things like CEOs, boards, and my boss. But you know, it ends up working out if you if you um, if you take a look at the really define the standout things and do that. I think a lot of this is comes down to channel strategy, right? We're a young business. We're on Facebook, not a lot of it, but it's real. Uh, born out of a fourth generation kitchen spider. And so for us, I got really tired of trying to compete in a four by five on Facebook with every other DTC cookware brand that's doing value prompts. It's not toxic. It's even heated. You can make an egg. <laughs> we we decided, okay, we're not gonna play in this four by five. This is not the place where our culinary stories and our craftsmanship and our chefs can go life. So we went to TV and we you know, went old school. And so I think a little bit of this is finding where the story matches the medium um, in a way that you can win, and not trying to cram all of your good brand juice into a paid social spot that everyone is gonna scroll past. If I hear thumb stopping one more time, <laughs> I'm gonna kill myself in a sub spot. But I think mean, finding the medium that matches the you know, scope of the message and the grandeur of the message is something that's been really exciting for us. And then only that distinction, right? Our competitors can't do TV because they're KCTTC fans, and that's the whole shit. We can do TV because our stores are big, and our chefs are massive and exciting, and it's you know, color and culture, it's not about the value of the fan. So I think some of it for us is just in finding the message in the medium. So, you know, I think that actually lends with us into the next question I have, which is, you know, culture is consistently evolving and moving, and I feel like in the past 10 to 20 years, it's been able to pick up pace even more because of all the technology that we have. So, you know, we have our brand message, and we have the way that we are speaking about ourselves, but how are you guys approaching, uh, ensuring that you are actually staying at pace with the speed of culture and communicating uh, to you know your different target audiences in a way that actually taps into what culture is looking like right now and not like sounding like 
ice bucket challenge, like <laughs> I'm doing that right now, it was 10 years ago, type messaging out there. So actually we're quite fortunate because, like I said, our chefs are the voice. They're the mouthpiece, they're the face of the brand. I don't have to be old, <laughs> thank God, because uh, they are exceedingly full and culture and leader in a strict way. And so for us, as long as we are representing a broad swath of our customer base, they will make sure that we are at pace. The other reality is cooking is fundamentally old and elemental. It's alchemy, it's magic. Um, it doesn't have to be trendy. And that's, I think, why I love it so much, is it's you know, so much to do with identity and so much to do with culture, and I never have to take some TikTok. And like that is my my happy place. But will you leave this? I think um, it's, a, it's a great question, like how do you, how do you stay culturally relevant? I think a, a maybe more important question for someone who's writing a brand to ask themselves is, um, do I need to be, or at least do I need to be all the time? And uh, there was one thing that, it was, I think it was my second week as basically the executive creative director on uh, CNN at uh, Upwork, and this local team asked us for a photo of a coffee mug, because it was International Coffee Day, apparently. And, um, I was like, yeah, I mean, we can make the most badass photo of how much we've ever fucking seen. <laughs> um, but should we? Do we have a narrative as a work around International Coffee Day, or was this something that was on social media calendar that you were checking a box next to? Um, give you an answer. I guess that's what the answer to that was. But um, the, what we ended up doing, this is how it was two weeks in, and I didn't want to ask so many TVs, I know we're not doing just a good idea. It was uh, how can we actually look at kind of what the connection between coffee and work is, that's a pretty obvious one. Coffee and hot work, that's a little more difficult. We had to kind of go back down to like what actually our brand stands for, which is you know, the most basic thing that people are looking for, people are looking to get work up. And so how can we use this moment to do that? So we ended up doing is rather than pull up coffee mug, we had a making our own coffee with a roast rat over it. Uh, we call it baby make because we're children and we're making a we try to get some corner settings. Um, and we had, we, we had uh, five illustrators on our platform, each one of them designed their own mag. We had a thousand of each, so five thousand total. And um, we did do our sales team. And we're like, hey, send these to all your best customers. You know, Microsoft, Google, they're going to be sold. And um, wish them out that, you know, happy International Coffee Day from us. But the, the beauty of it was is that, um, going back to our, our core kind of thing we're trying to do, just get people uh, with those who are going to hire them. Uh, each one of these bags served as a billboard for our town because you look at it, but it's a beautiful bag. Flip it over, scan the code card, the first we ever thought work. So it ended up, um, you know, giving us a reason to exist in this cultural moment as opposed to just being like, oh, let's do it. And um, yeah, it, like, I think it kept sharing like $400,000 in sales fees in like a week. So, coffee day. <laughs> <laughs> Your resume bullets are like really powerful. <laughs> Stats and like really good. Can you tell us about the earnings for my sake? Long green. Oh, come on, watch it. It's there. I mean, on working for Dell, a pretty conservative company and traditional in a, a long history, I know we've struggled with um, trying to remain authentic to who we are as a brand and still cater to a, a young audience like Gen Z, right, who demands brands stand for something, right? And a lot of times, Dell or any conservative company traditionally doesn't want to take a stand on a social issue or a political issue or a public issue. And I know that's been a really healthy dialogue for us internally and, and trying to navigate that. It's a new area that, you know, as a brand marketer, I have personal opinions, I have professional opinions, and where does that intersection kind of lie? It's been a really interesting and, quite honestly, a, a big challenge um, and just ongoing healthy debate internally about how do we stay true who we are as a company, how do we not polarize anybody, but how do we also show that we do understand our customers' wants and needs and that we, we, we do align with, with, with that. So that's just been an, an interesting ongoing thing that we don't have a finite answer for, but it's just an ongoing conversation that we continue to get to care about. Uh, I have two more questions. One that just came out of nowhere, and then the last one. But you know, I think there's there's 
speaking of culture and what's going on in the world, there's, look, there's so many things happening right now. And so I'm very interested in how you guys continue to move forward as brands and how you are caring for your brands during times where there are so many hot button issues happening around the country and the world. How are you guys approaching you know, a continued uh, conversation with the consumers while also being protective of the brands? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that sounds like a cop out, but you know, it's so polarizing that and you're serving a whole rainbow of customers. And so you, you, you really, unless it's you know something that is truly you know obvious, it's you know, it's it's support. And sometimes it's not something. I think it for us comes back to what's true, who are we? And what role do we have in the conversation? And as your pan salesman answers very rarely, <laughs> do you need to hear from us on XYZ? Yeah. Now, being responsible members of the universe, how are we internally as a company versus a brand, making sure we're being the moment and we are you know moving in the face of our employee base and that we are representative of our values, um, which to me is slightly different. Where are we as a business, where are we as a brand, and making sure that we you know, walk the walk, way before we talk the talk. Um, for us, that, you know, always includes working with all of our partners, whether they're chefs or manufacturers or the level of integrity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's got to come inside first, or the second you make a statement, the authentic employees are coming for you. Shrink to John from Kinder Scott perspective, super philanthropic brand. We found ourselves wanting to give it to everybody, just like, America, I was just like, let's go help this person. We were like supporting the Chihuahua rescue of like Benville, Arkansas. It's like so niche, which is amazing, right? And the Duluth Year Atlas, right? Where it's like you're, you're trying to be everything to everyone. And there was a moment in the brand where we had to have that conversation like, what are, the, what are the core things that are aligned to our values as a brand and a company and aligned to her as a founder? And so through that, yeah, we're still, the brand is still very philanthropic, but they've been able to curate some key moments throughout the year, some key causes that are really essential to Kendra, the founder, and namesake of the brand and, and the business. So that was and also an interesting exercise where it wasn't crisis mode, but it was from a philanthropic giving perspective, like, yes, you want to give plus the Chihuahuas, and like, there's got to be a line, right, where you, where you can make an impact and, and really break through. So it also helps you say no to things. So we have a long-term partnership with Southern Smoke Hospitality Relief, and it is a fundraising organization that puts money in the pockets of people in the hospitality industry facing crisis. That is my go-to answer when anyone wants me to sponsor a Chihuahua <laughs> And it really helps us say, you know, this is our own distinction. We live over here. This is our community. We stand by them 110 percent And I can't do these 17 other things that I'm okay to do. Um, and so I just wanted to wrap this up with just, I would love to get your one-liner or two-liners if you can do that. Um, it, for the marketers in here, I'd love for you guys to just give them your takeaway. If they're walking away today with an understanding of what's the most important thing they need to remember or understand when they are trying to do authentic storytelling to reach their audiences. What is that one bit of advice that you want these guys here to walk away with? I'll start from a meeting perspective. First of all, be authentic to your point. Um, but really, it's looking at that um, that whole funnel journey and making sure that you have content at each point, and not only at that educational stage and awareness stage, but also at that buying stage as well. Because content is no longer become a nice to have; it's a critical to have. I'd say that success is um, the result of making choices and sticking with them. Um, it also means making choices to not do things and sticking with that too. Um, and if you try to be something or not, or participate in a field in which you are not supposed to be in, uh, it won't spend no meaning. It's not going to be great. I would just make you back on that. You cannot be all things all people. And in a really bifurcated and digital media age, it's very easy to think you can segment your way into greatness. And these people will think I'm this, and these people will think I'm that. 
I think with some people, you get to the scale of the capital P brand. You gotta be who you are, and it's gonna work for some and it's not gonna work for others. And I think that was a brand in performance. So many conversations like, you can't measure brand, it's hugs and kisses. You can't, you can't pull from an empty cup. So I think it's just really leaning on that balance of art and science as a marketer, especially on the brand side, where um, it's that marathon and sprint type of, type of conversation where it will improve the bottom line, but it, it does take time. I'll leave you with my mic drop moment on this one. I always like to say, remember that at the end of the day, you're all humans and you're talking to humans. So don't forget the human beings that you're talking to. Unless they're zombies. And then remember the zombies that you used to do that. Yes, Former. Former. Her brains. <laughs>